folks have strong opinions on this one. The comments might get pretty wild. You might think a couple guys in cowboy hats are in a heated argument about politics, and then you realize that you just have a mule man and a horse man going at it about their preferred equine. My first horse was a mule named Willie, but we always had horses and mules as I grew up. There aren't astronomical differences. Most folks' opinion is a cultural one or based on a small sample size. They own two mules and four horses over their life. They like those individual horses better than those individual mules mules or vice versa. I've been around both horses and mules for over 30 years. I've owned 20 plus of each for at least 10 years. I give mules for the outfitting and working in the mountains application the slight win. All of that little win is really based on the scientific reality of hybrid vigor, also called heterosis. Horses are heavily interbred in the U.S. and Canada. Lots of inbreeding, breeding for specific traits, you know, aesthetics, you know, niche performance, all of that stuff. And the short and sweet is that if you keep breeding similar animals, the recessive genes start to become more common. And these recessive genes generally have mild downsides. With a horse slash donkey crossbreed, a mule, and the resulting heterosis, all of a sudden the core dominant genes are back and expressing themselves in the offspring. Probably committed some scientific felony in that description, but that is the gist. This is the same concept as ligers, right? Think about that old movie, Napoleon Dynamite. They talk about ligers. Well, ligers are a real thing, and they're bigger than both their parents. They're bigger than a lion, and they're bigger than a tiger. Hybrid vigor is why they express that large characteristic, but it's not just physical things. There are a few things that generally come out of hybrid vigor that we talk about with mules, and that's hardiness, longevity, and stamina. For someone in the wilderness packing business, all of these are relevant in a big way. First, you have the economics of keeping mules is much cheaper than horses. They keep weight better on them on poor feed, you have less vet bills, and they can work harder for longer periods of time. And also, in my experiences, they have less lameness issues. The longevity of their life is really important. Mules live into their 30s all the time, with a working life of 20 plus years being the normal. I've had mules that work for 25, 26 years of their life up in the mountains. Once you get a good set of mules, statistically, they will probably work in the guiding and outfitting business longer than you will. Horses generally check out after 20 to 24 years. Their working life is really more in the 12 to 17 year range. Now the hardiness and the economic efficiency is a little less important if you're a hobby packer. You aren't worried about the economics or you really wouldn't be a hobby packer with equines, right? It's an expensive hobby. But longevity should be super relevant to you. You're going to put a lot of effort into these animals. You get to know them well, you spend time with them in the mountains, and you get them working where they're useful. Why not have that useful life after you've got them all tuned in? Why not have that useful life twice as long? Now, it's also true that heterosis does make mules smarter than horses. It's actually proven scientifically that they have more cognitive ability. This differential, in my experience, comes out as more sure-footed or more personality. You know, that's how the mule guys put it. Now, the horse guys call this stubborn, untrustworthiness, pieces of shit. There's a a little divergence in the interpretation of a mule's intelligence there. Now how it plays out is like this. You might see even the gentlest, solidest mule start thinking about alternatives at times, almost like they're contemplating their position in life. Just out of the blue, one can decide it doesn't want to do what you are asking today. It's kind of like testing you, right? Kind of testing you what you're gonna what you're gonna be willing to put up with. It's kind of like a human child. They do the same thing. This is not a good thing when it comes to pack stock, but not major, and it's something a mule guy deals with. You know, just knock it off scenarios, a little, you know, a little pull on the lead rope, super minor kind of pay attention reminder typically solves it. Now, if you're pushing a mule's physical limitations, mules are smart enough to protect themselves. So he will think about alternatives in those situations always if you push him to the limit. If he's pushed enough, he's going to execute on those alternatives regardless of your actions. You can ride a horse to death from thirst or ride one off a cliff. You're not going to pull that off with a mule. Horses tend to follow the protocol once they are trained, you know, do 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 do. That can be a good thing. Maybe a bad thing in some small cases, but generally a good thing. They tend to really trust you. You know, let's do it, boss. That's a horse's mentality. That is a nice thing about horses in a lot of ways. But mule intelligence also comes out in some positive self-preservation habits 
on the practical aspects of the trail. A lot of horses just flop their feet around, right? Just flailing it everywhere like a blumbering idiot. You rarely see a mule do that. They place their feet with intention. You see them look at the trail more. You know, they're looking where are they going to stick their next foot. You always see them looking. You see them looking down at the trail and they, they place those feet with intention. They also have more cognition of the trail conditions. You know, they baby step on ice. You know, they lay their ass down if they're going into a slick turn, you know, a muddy slick turn on a switchback. They'll put their weight on their ass and ride it out. They're smart about that stuff. You know, I've had horses follow me in just flat areas. Just, you know, come out of a turn. I'm going over a flat and a horse just rolls right on me. I've had that happen several times. And it's just from flopping their feet around, not paying attention. But mules rarely fall. And a lot of the times they fall because they get slick it in a string right you know by some wrangler hauling ass in the lead not watching their string that's typically why a mule will fall and when a mule does get in a wreck they are just sturdier you know less broken bones less disasters i'll tell you a quick story about a mule that i had named abe it was end of the season you know probably november 20th we had to pack a camp out that was like 10 7 something like that bunch of snow but the worst part about it, we'd had conditions that were warming up and this was kind of an Aspen transition area. They would get sun during the day. So that snow was melting off and at night it was icing up. And this trail, if you tried to hike on it, you would have slipped your ass off every five, six feet. And so these poor mules, we've got them strung up and we've got like 10 or 11 with us to get the camp out. And they're just struggling up this hill, but we're making it happen. And then right as we get to the last switchback before you pop up on the plateau there you know I just hear guys hollering behind me and I see Abe's just slid his ass off the trail right but he was maybe five six feet down the down the uh, hill there in the snow and he's and he's in a, a big aspen grove this thing is a huge aspen grove it's got a bunch of deadfall in it you know kind of some older older chunks of the aspens are dying but he wouldn't get up and this is pretty common for horses or mules when they fall and they're loaded you know they're packed and they're loaded you know or if they just have a saddle on they feel constrained and they'll basically just lock up and sit there they kind of look almost dead i jump off my horse i was in the lead i, I pop down the switchbacks and I get down there with one of my guys and he's got him, he's trying to get him up. I reach down and, I, and I'm able to cut the latigo and pull his saddle off. And the minute I pull his saddle off, he jumps up, just pops up because he feels that freedom, right? He can get a good breath and he can, he can stand up. Well, when he stands up, you know, we're talking about a hillside that's slick like this. And he wants to get his ass back up on the trail with his buddies, the other mules, you know, his family. When he jumps up, he lunges to the trail and he, and he slips again. And I watch this mule Abe, I watch him roll down probably 300 yards through the aspens and get momentum. As he's sliding his ass down there, he's hitting, he's hitting these dead aspens and they're falling. You know, I'm talking, you know, 20, 30 foot, you know, aspen trees, not huge ones, but this diameter, this big that are dead. He's hitting them and two or three of them, they're falling down as, he, as he's rolling down the hill, he's hitting those things, you know. You know, every roll I see his shoes just shining there, boom, boom, boom. Had to have been five or six times I saw him roll. And in the snow, I see just a slick of blood down to him. I'm thinking he's toast, you know. Shit, man, he's dead, but. I gotta, you know, deal with it. So I get down and I, I shimmy down there on my ass and I get down to him and he's, he's laying down again. He looks at me, but I can't see any holes in him. All he's got is he's got just kind of a, a bleeder of a cut just down his chest, you know, just like this, just where it ripped his, just where it ripped his hide open, probably two feet long, but didn't go through, you know, any of the secondary tissue, you know, just, just took that hide open right there. And so I realized that he's probably okay, you know, and I, I'm thinking to myself like, holy shit, how is he okay? He just rolled down 400 yards, you know, hitting trees, knocking them over. And sure enough, I get him up and I get him in front of me because I don't want him to trounce all over me trying to get back to the trail. And I pull his halter off and that mule just slowly goes up that steep shit. And it takes him probably, you know, uh, whatever two two three minutes it ends up taking me about 20 30 minutes to get up this deal right so he gets back up there i check his wound out again he's okay we end, we end up going taking him up there packing him with gear because we needed him we needed the space and he needed the whole weight so we packed the camp out got him home and he survived the situation i doubt a horse would have done that he they're just tough as nails that way a couple years after that what happens with horses and mules a lot particularly you know, high elevations and hard winters, when they get older, that's usually how they meet their end, right? They just can't keep their weight on during the winter. And I basically love Dave. He's like a good employee for seven or eight years, you know, a great employee and a friend. I spent a lot of days, 
you know, by myself in the wilderness, packing around that mule, talking to myself, talking to him or whatever. So in a way, he was my friend. What happens to him is they get ketogenic, right, where they're, where they're living off their fat supplies, and then they burn through that fat supplies, and they start burning up their muscles. And you see it in their thighs. You, know, you see that the, their, their thighs get concavity, and they start to lose all that muscle. And that's generally the end. And that's the, you know, what they're doing is they're starving to death. And at that point, you know, point kind of no return, you know, you try to feed them, you try to supplement them uh, with what you can, but if they can't keep on weight, you know, that's usually the end of their life, end of their lives. And Abe was well over 30 years old, he's probably 32, 33 years old. And I remember I tied Abe to a post, like I usually do, to kill him. And in a very sad moment, it made me smile. I thought about that moment and watching him roll down that hillside and hit those aspens. And I thought to myself, when I pull this trigger, there's a pretty damn good chance that this bullet ricochets off his head. Now, a couple idiosyncratic things to me personally on my preference for mules. I have bad knees, so a broader shoulder horse is hard on me. Mules physically tend to have smaller shoulders than a lot of the trail riding horse breeds, right? And the other thing related to that is because of their stamina and hardiness, pound for pound, I can ride a smaller mule, right? And riding a smaller animal, for me, it leads to less knee pain. Just that broadness is what, what makes it hurt. Okay, so if mules are so good, outside of the little caveats I've mentioned so far, why doesn't everyone use them? A matter of fact, why is there actually more horses on the mountains than mules? One, just aesthetics. People like the look of horses over mules. Two, the outcrossing to create mules results in a lot more what I'll call personality phenotypes. A lot of the inbreeding of horses is for physical traits, right? but a ton of it is also for disposition. Certain breeds of horses are pretty universally docile. If you aren't a horse person, think about it in the context of labs or golden retrievers. It's pretty damn rare that one of those is gonna be downright mean. A whole litter of 10 lab puppies and not one of them will ever bite someone is usually the case. The mule outcrossing introduces volatility. Even the same pair of jack, you know, that's a male donkey and a mare, can produce widely different personalities in their, off, their mule offsprings. I think this is why you will hear, you know, a good mule is better than a good horse, but a bad mule is 10x worse than a bad horse. That saying is because there's just these mules that are just dickhead outliers. That does exist. The other thing about mules is they're really not built for riding. They are great to ride, but they aren't built for it physically, right? They have less withers and their bodies are rounder. This comes from the donkey. So the withers are basically the high point of the shoulder, you know, a little bump on the back of a shoulder, uh, the back of the, you know, above the shoulder on a horse if you're looking at a broadside and that actually keeps hold of the saddle mules tend to have a much flatter back and they have a rounder body and it just doesn't hold a saddle as well those confirmation differences come from the donkey side so a guy can mitigate that by having the right equipment right you gotta have a good breast collar you gotta have a britchner or a crouper you gotta have the proper tree to fit them in your saddle but it's also very important that you know how to ride when you're riding a mule or you're more likely to tear them up if you're riding a mule in the mountains and you don't realize that your saddle's riding up or you don't realize that your saddle's riding way back, you're way more likely to gall them. You're way more likely to saddle swarm if you're not conscious of that. A guy that can ride pretty well will know that. He can ride with a little looser cinch. You know, he knows when he's up a little bit high. He knows when he's back a little bit on the mule. So he can, he can deal with that. But if you take, you know, if you take somebody who hasn't ridden a lot, you know, and they get on a mule and they just tighten that cinch up like holy hell, they tighten up the britching as tight as they can, they tighten up the breast collar as tight as they can, yeah, the saddle's gonna stay there and it's not gonna fall off that round kind of wither, witherless back of a mule, but all those contact points are gonna give you a way higher likelihood that you're gonna tear up that mule and end up saddle soaring them. That's no good and it's not fair to the mule. So that's for sure a downside of mules in the mountains. The other one, guys, is just really related to local avail availability. Most of my mules used to come from the Amish and I had Amish guys working for me that would get them for me. There's more mules on the East Coast, you know, Missouri, Ohio, that part of the country. A lot of areas, there's not a reliable source of mules, so that comes into play, and that's why a lot of guys end up with, with a string of horses or a couple horses to use in the mountains, just because of their availability. If you're in an area and you can't find mules, don't get dead set on them, see? Because if, if there's limited selection, you have more chances of getting the bad ones, right? Because they end up, 
you know, they end up in that area and they end up for sale. A lot of my riding stock were horses for this reason. Just the availability of good riding stock, there tended to be more horses. And that's the reason that I rode a horse a lot over the years of my outfitting. But the other thing is, is usually I had a responsibility of taking care of other people when I was outfitting. If I needed to barrel back in a chaotic situation, a decent horse follows you into the storm. A mule might second guess it or might have a third thought about agreeing with you. And so that in the context of helping other people, horses get a little bit of, of the edge. Guys, I have a whole series about hunting horseback on the YouTube channel. If you guys are into this, I recommend you go check it out. And in the future, I'll also have a bunch more videos on pack animals. I'll kind of extend all those, those previous older videos and I'll make them better and higher quality and cover a whole bunch of stuff. You know, packing, you know, my thoughts on taking care of them up in the mountains, getting them fed well in the mountains. There's a whole science to that. It's almost, you know, it's almost a, a totally separate skill set to mountain hunting, right? Taking care of pack stock is a pretty serious endeavor up there. All right, guys, that's my thoughts on mules versus horses, and I'm sticking to it. If you have comments or you got something you disagree with, please leave it down below.